Hallelujah. How many spirit-filled believers are in the house tonight? Amen. Are you? Amen. You see, the way that we behold Jesus is the way that we live. The way that we see him is the way that we act. The way that we know him is the way that we represent. Amen. A lot of people, though, unfortunately, believers, see this tamed, looking, rosy cheeks Jesus. Hmm. Right? Like, we are made in his image, but unfortunately, we see him as in our image. Okay, so that's why we um, easily get intimidated. We easily get affected. We easily get discouraged, disheartened, because we try to learn who we are in the midst of the fight. You see, we have to know already who we are in Christ Jesus before we even get into the role or the position because when you're in it already and you try to know who you are, you're not going to make it. It's a little too late because you're already in war and you're not prepared. You don't know who you are in Christ, so therefore you're going to waffle. You're going to, your knees are going to buckle and you're going to retreat. Okay, because you don't know the weapons that you need to use. You know that our weapons are mighty to God, that the strongholds, what are strongholds? Strongholds are like fences, right, or uh, like a barricade. It's a stronghold that, that keeps supposedly in uh, camps in, you know, in, when they used uh, fortresses before. They are just that. It's to, um, it's to keep the enemy out, right? And it's hard to break down. But, you know, that's what the enemy puts in our heads. And our mind, our mind is the minefield. It is the battleground of the enemy. And when we allow those thought bombs to enter our thoughts, our minds, then that's when we get defeated. That's where we get defeated. That's how, that's how, uh, it's, it's like an insidious uh, tactic of the enemy. And that's how he uh, beguiled, what's her name? Eve, in the garden. Okay, he beguiled, uh, you know, it's like he is twisting the truth, the questions that, that he asks. It's like, you know, God said, if you eat that fruit of that tree, you will surely die. And what does Satan say? He questions her. Did he really say that? If you eat that fruit, you won't surely die. So what do we believe anyway as believers or as Christians, as believers actually? What do we believe? Do we believe what God says or do we believe them intimidating spirits? See, every Every intimidation or accusation is not from God. None of it is from God. It's from the accuser, the accuser of our soul. The enemy of intimidation attacks our soul. It's not defeated through psychology, y'all, or positive thinking. It's not. And, you know, we were talking about this last, just this weekend. The answer to our problems in the world is nothing but Jesus. But we keep ousting him. We keep taking him out of the equation. We keep putting him on the shelf. And we try to do all these meth methodologies and philosophical answers and views right. that none of it works. Right. Amen. But we still, we won't give up because of pride because of pride. We think that we can do it on our own or we try to help God, but he doesn't need our help. He needs our obedience. Amen? Our weapon against intimidation is the sword of the Spirit. But how many of us uses the word or the sword of the Spirit? It is the word. That is, the Bible is where the word is at, right? 
but how many of us utilize the Bible and, and use it and actually live it and walk in it? Because that's, we need to speak back. When the enemy's talking to you, to me, to us, we need to talk back. We need to fight back. And we need to declare who we are and whose we are in Christ. We need, that's what Jesus did right after he went into the wilderness. What happened? For 40 days, he didn't eat. So he was what? Starving. You know, and, and the enemy tempted him. And immediately, what, what does he say? You should not tempt the Lord thy God, right? You should, he came back with the word three times. And that's what we need to do. But if we don't know the word, we don't know what to say. We don't have a rebuttal. We don't have our weapon, right? It's not loaded. It's not sharpened. It's not used. It's put on the shelf, so it's ineffective. The word of God is effective. It is alive, quick, and powerful. But it's only that if we know its meaning, if we know its use. Amen? So there is that uh, spirit that likes to remain anonymous, which is that fear and intimidation. Okay? And that job function of that spirit of fear is to paralyze us as believers, okay? Christians are paralyzed emotionally and spiritually. Why? It paralyzes us, and that's the, the job function, so that we can be ineffective, so that we can't move forward, so that we can't be useful and productive. And so why is it so many Christians are paralyzed? Because they've sat down, they've given up their harps, right? And they succumb to that spirit of fear and timidity. What does the Bible say? God did not give us the spirit of fear and timidity, but the spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. You see, we have to know how to come back to whatever it is that's causing us to feel defeated. We have to know how to come back. You can't keep using the same scripture to different situations. You've got to know if you need healing, you've got to find the healing scriptures. If you need, if you need um, financial wealth or finances, blessings, you need to know the scriptures there as well. I mean, you have to present your case to God so that he knows how, he knows that you know what you need and what you want from him. If we can go to Ephesians six seventeen, we have to be standing firm on God's word and realize that it is his will. God is word, or Jesus was the word, and the word was with God. And that was in the beginning, right? So Ephesians 6, 17. Accept God's salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, and that sword is the teaching of God. That's the easy to read version. Y'all like it? I appreciate it, right? It's the teaching of God. Okay, so the word of God teaches us, directs us, leads us. Amen? And if we can go to Isaiah 54, 17. See, this is the heritage of the servants of the living God. This is, this is, people will make weapons to fight against you, but their weapons will not defeat you. And we know that in King James has, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Amen? Some people will say things against you, but anyone who speaks against you will be proved wrong. The Lord says, that is what my servants get. They get the good things that come from me, their Lord. Amen. Amen. And God does not ever withheld good things from his upright servants. Amen? But see, we got to know who that Jesus is. I mean, how do you behold Jesus? And that's how he will respond to you. Or that's how you will respond to him, rather. If you think that he is your 
genie, then that's what you think he is. So you don't believe your prayers because you don't believe you, right? And genie is not real. So you're just really hoping away, but you're not really standing or believing in God's word. Amen? You know, in the book of um, First uh, Samuel, I mean, this is like <clears throat> one of my favorite stories, and so does apparently Brother Charles, is, you know, David and Goliath. I think even, even heathens know this story, I think. Okay? David and Goliath. See, intimidation, it, this is like the meaning, implies that someone causes you to act timid or fearful, cowering down. It also implies the different ways the enemy might cause you to be disheartened, including me. So if we can go to 1 Samuel 17, 10 through 11, we see here that Goliath is taunting David. Okay, the Philistine also said today, he's talking to David or to the Israelites, I stand and make fun of the army of Israel. I dare you, he says, to send me one of your men and let us fight. Saul and the Israelite soldiers heard what Goliath said, and they were very afraid. See how words can be intimidating, right? Like when you, you know, how Muhammad Ali was taunting and intimidating. He intimidated um, Frazier. That was the... Thriller, thriller of Manila. I was still a, a young kid then, but um, I was, of course, rooting for the underdog. But, but Muhammad Ali was really good at that, right? He knows how to intimidate. And this is what Goliath was doing to David or to the Israelites at this point. Now, if we can uh, go to um, go down verse 36. This is what David's response is. He said, he reminded himself, and he's declaring to um, Goliath what he did. I killed both a lion and a bear like that. And I will kill that foreigner, Goliath, just like them. Goliath will die because he made fun of the army of the living God. He is declaring that because you are this uncircumcised Philistine, Philistine, however, tomato, tomato, right? Uh, making fun of my God, our God, I will show you and make sure that you don't live today. Amen. So if we go down further hurlings at David, 1743 through 44, he said to David, more accusations, right? Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine caused David, cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. So the more that Goliath hurled accusations to David to intimidate him further, the more that he mocked him the stronger and braver David you know, became. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, he said, today, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And those, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all, or all of you, into our hands. And today we're still talking about that story, and the whole world knows that there is a God in Israel. Amen. You see, David 
David made a declaration and he realized, he made sure, he knew that it was for God's purpose and through God's purpose and God's purpose only. He wasn't bragging about anything else, but he knew. He stood upon the word of the Lord, and he knew that that's what was going to happen. That's it. He didn't use a gun. He didn't use a rifle. He didn't use a sword. He didn't use any of that. He used a slingshot. It's the weapon that he was most comfortable with. It's the weapon that he knew how to use, and he used it. A lot of us try to, you know, Saul tried to give him his, his whole armor, right? But he said, no, I can't use that. I haven't even tested that. And he, could hardly, he couldn't hardly walk because it was too heavy. So he used what, what he had in his hands. So we have to learn how to use what God has given us. We have to know who we are. We can't be trying to be like somebody else. Because we all have anointing, an anointing, we're all anointed, but we should not covet what that other sister or that other brother has, because we all have a gift, and we have to use our gift accordingly. Otherwise, we're like insulting God. So he knew how to use a slingshot, and that's what he used to kill Goliath, and he succeeded. Amen? Again, our mind is the battleground. False words of the enemy can easily become a fortress of unbelief. We have to learn how to say, you know what, you can talk to the hand because not today, Stan. Not today. We have to learn how to fight back with our words. I don't know about you, but when I have some thought bombs in my head, I do speak loudly. I tell my mind, it's like, stop it. Sometimes you may think I'm crazy if you hear me. That means I am talking to the voices in my head, like, stop, like, quit, or, you know, I am not attending anybody's party, especially not pity party, especially not my own, okay? It's like, nope, I am not giving in, and I am not going to feel intimidated by anyone or anything. Anyone could be anyone, and anything could be like a position, a challenge, or an assignment that you think is so big that you lose focus and you forget that your God or my God is bigger. See, those things around us can seem very large, you know, if we focus on them, right? If we if we keep our eyes focused on our problems, then our God seems smaller. You know, when you feel anxious and you feel um, scared or confused, you know, those things come, but you better, you better be ready to cast them down and to know how to talk back to those issues, to those challenges. And you, you better believe the word. You better know that what you're talking about really lives in your heart, that you actually believe it because God has come through for you time and, and again. Amen? <clears throat> if we can go to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. See, the weapons we use are not human ones. The weapons we use are not human human ones. So, <clears throat> what are they? <clears throat> Excuse me. Our weapons have power from God and can destroy the enemy's strong places. We destroy people's arguments. That's it. There's a comma. <laughs> we destroy people's arguments, philosophies, we destroy whatever it is that they're coming against us. And sometimes we fight the person. We want to fight the person, but it's really the spirit behind it. And they have that intimidating spirit. So what is that up there? And every lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. And take, that's what I thought, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 
So we do have, we, we have to remember when the enemy puts a thought bomb there or just it just comes up because, hey, you know, we used to be that and we are not anymore, but the enemy does not have any original thoughts. So he'll keep using those things that made you bound before. So when they come back up, we need to know how to throw it back at him, yeah. right? We throw it back at him with force, with vengeance and say, not today. I'm like, you're not reminding me of that again, because you know what? God has already put that in the deepest part of the sea to where you cannot remember or dig it up again. But a lot of times, we like to dig. We like to go to this graveyard and dig up the past, those dead bones that, that don't belong to us anymore. Amen? You see, <clears throat> Elijah, okay, Elijah was a great prophet. He's also one of the greatest characters in the Bible. All right. He had a great <clears throat> victory over Ahab and Jezebel. He prophesied drought, challenged the prophets of Baal to see who's God, right? And God consumed his sacrifice. He had 850 false <clears throat> prophets killed, prayed for rain, and outran a chariot to Jezreel. But notice that the spirit of Jezebel and uh, the intimidation through, spirit of intimidation through Jezebel and caused him to run. Let's go to 1 Kings 19, 1, 3. A woman will do that to you. <laughs> It'll cause you to run, right? Uh, but this woman is a different kind of woman. She's got that spirit, that, that demonic, you know, evil spirit. In, in him. I'm sure Elijah knew that Jezebel, and I'm sure we all, I, I, I thought this, that Jezebel was part of his assignment, right? But what caused that? Have, I don't know. Have you ever asked that question? It's like, wow, after he, a great, great victory, a woman caused Elijah to lose his ministry? Because you know, he didn't make it back. He didn't come back, even though God pursued him. Even though God ran after him or, or, you know, pursued is the better word. Pursued him. He didn't make it back. He actually gave the mantle, right, to Elisha. But why did he run? Okay, so here it is. Opening the door to Jezebel we can expect that spirit to spew accusations. Okay, he opened the door, and how? He, when he started, let's go, let's go there, to um, 1 Kings 18, 27. Okay, and at noon, Elijah mock them, okay? He mock them, saying, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he must be asleep and must be awakened, or he is asleep and must be awakened. Elijah was taunting the enemy on his own. Okay, it's on his own. I mean, it's kind of funny, it's good because he's like bragging on God, but that's, that was really not glorifying to God, right? He was, he was being funny, he was taunting them on his own. It doesn't sound like what David said. Do you see the difference? Do you see what David was saying? He was talking about, you know, what God has done through him how he slew the bear and the lion in his own hands. And that's the same way I'm going to kill you. Okay? But in here, he was, he was taunting them on his own. I mean, it's pretty funny, but, you know, he got the job done. But <clears throat> it, was not <clears throat> it was not from the heart of God. It's something out of Elijah's heart that was an unmet need. So when we function in the power of God 
and misrepresent his heart, that spirit, that spirit of Jezebel can come in. And look what happened. You know, a mighty man of God ran away and lost his ministry because of a woman. And it's a spirit, that spirit of Jezebel. Amen. And, you know, that same thing happened to Moses, right? When he smote the rock and instead of, what was he supposed to do? He did not do what God said. And he said that he struck the rock because he thought that God must have been angry with the people. Well, I don't think he was. Maybe he was frustrated. But no, it was Moses who was getting angry with the people. He was frustrated with their whining and complaining. That's why he was frustrated to struck the rock. Even though water came out, he never went into the promised land. Okay, so he lost out or he missed out on that. And then if we can go further, okay, let's go to Jude 1, 9. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you know, there was a warfare in Moses. There was warfare going on in Moses' body, about Moses' body. All right, like where it was going to be. But here it's in um, Jude 1, 9. It says, not even the ark angel Michael did this. Michael argued with the devil about who would have the body of Moses. He didn't do that. But Michael did not dare to condemn even the devil for his false accusations. Instead, Michael said, the Lord punish you. See how words are so powerful? Even the angel was afraid to say anything out of line. Because you know what? Humility really Humility is key. It is humility and the fear of the Lord that gives us safeguards. You know, when, just remember, the spirit of um, Jezebel, the spirit of intimidation are out of pride and arrogance. Look at me. Look how I came back to him or her. Look how I was witty. Look how I have a quick comeback. You should have heard what I said. You should have seen how I did it. Right? That's not Christ-like. That's not in the image of God. That's not how Christ should be represented, right? But we've all been guilty of that. We've all been guilty of that. So when we act like that, the spirit of intimidation, the spirit of Jezebel, that kind of spirit, can easily cause us to crawl back, to run away, because we are not standing on God's promises or word, but we are actually doing it in our own wit, in our own strength, in our own might. What does the word say? Not by might, nor by power, but by the spirit of the living God. Amen. So, you know, when we, when we um, have that, that, I don't know when you see that spirit. Do you, what do you do? Because at work, <clears throat> at work, I, you know, I'm there majority of the time. And there is that spirit of intimidation, you know, from every angle, from staff, from colleagues, and from clients and patients alike. You know, they want to be the boss, they want to intimidate you. And, and, and there is this article that I read a, a while back. You know, I remember, I, I, it, it says, when you want to intimidate someone in business, I don't know if this is from Night and Forgotten, but if you want to go intimidate someone, you bring two secretaries with you. And you don't say a word, you don't do anything, but you just make your presence known, bring two secretaries, and let them write stuff. And already, before you even open your mouth, you are intimidating because you have two secretaries instead of one. And see, that's like, uh, where, where's that angle coming from, right? From pride and arrogance, because you want to have your way by might, by manipulation, by, by being conniving, by being underhanded, by being devious. But that's not Christ-like. We are 
We are to operate in the spirit of love and humility because that's how Jesus is. Not tame, though. He is Jesus Christ, like a barbarian, a revolutionary. He is a man that I see Jesus, you know, before being in Catholic uh, Catholicism, I really did think that Jesus looked the way that they depicted him, you know, c curls, like maybe like a perm. <laughs> and um, he's like light skinned from the Middle East and a carpenter, but he's got no dirt on him, right? He, he's, he doesn't look sweaty like I am right now. <laughs> he's not dirty. He, I mean, I, I'm not saying that he should be dirty, but he has, he's just like looking so totally tamed, so totally docile, right? But that's not how Jesus is, or that's not how Jesus, the Jesus that I serve. I know that he is a man with a comeback, a comeback that is righteous, a comeback that is worth emulating. He lived for 33 years, and that should be our example. He knew how to talk to intimidate, intimidating crowds or people without being out of character, right? I mean, you know, rebuking one of his disciples, he didn't mince his words. He exposed that spirit when he, you know, just right after he was saying blessings over Peter, he says, you know, get thee behind me, Satan. It's like he knew what that spirit is and how it's operating. And so we should be able to see that and we should be able to address it and we should be able to confront it and not be intimidated. Even with our loved ones, right? Even with our, okay, so again, I'm going to go back to the workplace first and then deal with our families, right? So in the workplace, yeah, you know, sure, customer service, you know, I was just sharing with someone, I feel that where I work now, I can totally relate and understand why DMV is the way that it is. It's like no customer service, they don't care, the line's long and you wait, you have an appointment, you don't, so I don't care, attitude, right? Because it's a massive place that people don't want to go to but need to be there, right? And you know what, where I work, Practically, that's how it is now. That's how it feels like. And yeah, no shame. I'm saying this. It's like, I'm not going to put it on LinkedIn, but maybe eventually, you know? It's like, come on. You know, when the business, the, the economy opened up, we're seeing twice the amount of people with appointments and walk-ins, but less people. What the what, right? It's like, and then they want to intimidate you by they meaning the organization, by not doing anything and act like they're supporting you by asking you what you need, but not providing it. Or, anyway, the, <laughs> I could go on and on about that. So it's, it's really that intimidating because then you're working hard enough so that, or working hard, because you don't want to lose your job, right. right? Because you value your job, but it's to the point where, no, this is toxic. This is ridiculous. I am a child of the living God. I am a daughter of the king, so I don't have to put up with this kind of mess. Right. So my point is, don't do anything, you know, foolish. My point is, my point is, if you know what that, that spirit is, is handing you, you need to throw it right back. You need to throw it right back because we don't need, I don't, I feel like I do not need to suffer needlessly. I'm not even suffering for, from persecution because of my faith, right? That's what really is terrible. How are you, how do you feel so oppressed? You know, um, I heard one of my staff 
saying, you know, I never felt this way, but I feel like this from, I remember from when my grandpa died, she said. It's like, and, and she's only been there like a month <laughs> or two months, two months. She's only been there uh, three weeks with me and four weeks elsewhere, right? And, you know, I just like shook my head. It's like, you know, that is an intimidating spirit because she's already dreading. She says, I go to bed at 7. Sometimes I don't even go to lunch because she's trying to save her energy for the day, you know, ahead. And I thought, you know, this is not healthy. This is not normal. It's like, I don't want to work here. I don't, I don't, you know, anyhow. <sighs> It's not going to be about my job, right? So let's move to the family circle. Okay, so the family, I know. See, when I get started, it's like, you know, I, I don't need to justify my position, but I'm saying it can be intimidating. It can be intimidating in that circle. And in our homes, it's the same thing. You know, when we are trying to please our either our mates or our children that are grown and we don't want to uh, step over the line or on their toes, and they're doing something that, you know, that, that isn't right. We feel intimidated because we don't want them to not like us anymore or not respond to us the way that, you know, that they're supposed to. It's like, what? Why is that? If you know who you are and if you know where you stand, if you know your purpose, if you know whose you are, then why are you cowering down to that spirit? Yes, there are moments that you feel like you do, but snap out of it and get over it. Amen? Quickly. You have to realize that it is an intimidating spirit. You have to realize that that is the enemy playing on you. Because you know what? When you stand up, when you say what you need to say, when you do what you need to do, in the long run, you will get that respect. And if you don't, so what? So what? But you have the favor of God. You have the approval of God. You are pleasing to God, right? Isn't that what we want? But we forget because we forget who we are. We forget that we are made in Jesus Christ's image, but we, we think that he is made in our image, right? We try to conform him to our image, and that is the problem. That's why we have unfulfilled dreams. That's why we have unpursued dreams, because we don't believe what we claim to believe. We don't believe what we claim that Jesus said we can have or we have, right? Because if you know Jesus, if you know God, and you are standing upon his word, it's like you know, you know that you know. He says you have not because you ask not, right? So if we being evil according to the word, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more can God, or does God, will God give gifts to us? See, this is a learning process, right? This is a learning, it's a life learning journey. And we learn together. We learn as a body. We learn individually and we learn corporately, which is why it's so important to not lose sight of the fellowship, which is not, which is why it's so important that we stay connected with one another and be real, be transparent. And in that transparency, we have to see growth, right? A little here, a little there, a little, it's a little at a time, just putting your one foot forward. It's knowing that we are to go forward, moving in that direction, and realizing again, realizing what God has given you. What do you have in your hands? What do you have in your hands? Your gifts, your gift will make a way for you. But don't surrender it to that spirit of intimidation. You know, you, you, when you sometimes keep your mouth shut, there are things where you don't need to say. It does not warrant a response. But there are times and situations where you have to talk back. 
where you have to say something, where you have to respond. Just know the difference. You can't keep trying to win an argument because sometimes there is no argument, right? There is no argument. Jesus didn't argue when they were about to crucify him. Because why? Because he knows he had to do that. He knows he had to go through it. He says, you're not taking my life, right? What did he say? I am laying it down. You're not taking my life. See, that he said, right? That he said. But all the other questioning, he kept quiet, right? Because it was, it, it was pointless. There was no argument. There was no arguing. So to say that, speak the word. Speak the word of God and use your sword. The Holy Bible is our weapon. Don't let it be dusty. Don't let it be uh, not sharpened. What do you call it? A dull. Don't let it be useless because in it, is the word of God, and it pertains to our life. This is the Bible, the basic instruction before leaving earth. And we have to utilize it like our life depends on it, because it does. Amen?